content warning, this episode contains discussion of the murder and sexual exploitation of children. The bulk of this episode is going to be an interview we recently conducted with an expert, and we'll tell you about her in a moment. But we want to take a moment here at the beginning of the episode to discuss a new article that appeared today in the Daily Mail. This article was about Delphi, obviously. It made a number of sensational claims. The gist of it being that Richard Allen, the man who's facing charges in this murder, uh, Kagan Klein, and Ron Logan all somehow worked together and were involved in a ring together, which ultimately led to the murder of Abby and Libby. Now, it's very tempting in this case and all crime cases to make links between different people who come up. It leads to a more satisfying narrative for people following along and the media because you're essentially saying, you know, all these people that were sort of disparate and different threads, you're weaving them together and saying it's all linked, right? Uh, So there's a temptation to kind of take these stories very seriously. And so we did that today. We basically, when we saw it, we were fortunate enough to get um, links to it from from different listeners and different people who follow this. Thank you to everyone who sent it to us. Yeah, we really appreciate people when you do that because it lets us kind of stay informed and kind of get to know, okay, this is what people are hearing. This is what people are looking at. So keep doing that. You guys are great. Anyways, basically, when we uh, got those, we started calling around our sources and people uh we trust and respect in the case and trying to see, okay, is this true? Is there this nexus of Alan Klein Logan coming into play? That is a kind of the new theory for the case. And what we discovered is that no, that is not the case. Uh, Basically everybody we talked to today sort of said that that was not what was going on in the actual investigation. We hear some colorful phrases from our sources, basically indicating a very low opinion of the accuracy of the information in the article. In other words, we were told that the article was basically untrue. And we're not uh, going to go through every single claim made in the article and debunk it. I don't feel like it's our job to be the, you know, police of the Delphi, you know, media coverage. I, I just think that it is worth stating that we were not able to replicate what that article said. And uh, I think one thing that's important to remember that in journalism, especially when uh, different media outlets are relying on anonymous sources, as we do, replication is kind of a good metric. Because if, if one outlet reports something and nobody else is hearing the same thing, then that can proved to be somewhat problematic, and and that should be kind of taken into account. Uh, It also might be worth pointing out that someone has reached out to us in the past telling us things similar to what was in this article and never offered up any evidence to verify their claims. And so we chose not to report on it. And also we never found anybody else who backed up those claims. So we chose not to report on it. I would say that in a case as high profile as Delphi, it's so important to be judicious about what you publish. I think it's great to talk to a lot of different people behind the scenes with a lot of different views. But as far as running and publishing that information... That's a bit of another story because you hear all sorts of things behind the scenes and a lot of it is just speculation and a lot of it is just people trying to draw connections where there are no obvious connections. So this isn't us saying that there's no links between anybody or every element of the article is is wrong. It's just that we're hearing behind the scenes that there is not this massive link that they've uncovered and are going to base their case around. That's that's really very much not what we're hearing. And I think, you know, when, when that's kind of getting out in the media, it's, it's a bit, uh, it just kind of reminds you that it is important to, you know, 
just because a story sounds really good and really interesting and kind of fits everybody's expectations or hopes that everybody involved in this crime, if multiple players were involved, gets, you know, the the punishment that's coming to them. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily responsible to put that out there if that's not what people are really saying behind the scenes and vet your sources. You know, it's, it's not all sources are created equal. I mean, it, there's a big difference between someone who is in a position to know things and somebody who's in a position to speculate endlessly. So I guess uh, the gist of what we're saying is we don't have confidence in the accuracy of that story. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. The story does concern references to uh, rings involving child sexual abuse materials. Obviously, rings like that exist, and I think it's hard for anybody to sort out what is true and what is false about such rings because there's all sorts of sensationalistic media reports. And it's also a situation where normal people don't think like that and don't behave like that. So I feel like it can be a bit difficult for the average citizen to get a really good lock on like, okay, here's what a here's what a pedophile ring actually looks like, because it's just it's very foreign to most people. So as is our practice, when something comes up in this case, that we're not familiar with and that we suspect our audience may not be familiar with, we go and find an expert to talk with. The expert we are talking with today is Catalan Howard. She is a crime analyst who has a variety of experience with a number of agencies. She'll discuss some of that in the interview. Uh, She also uh, has a special affinity and a skill for working on cases that involve children who have been victims of sexual abuse. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're The Murder Sheet, and this is... The Delphi Murders, a conversation with crime analyst Catalan Howard. Starting off, tell us a little bit about yourself and and sort of the work you do. Sort of take us through your career and and what it entails. I I went to school for neuroscience in Canada. I'm Canadian, dual citizen. Dropped out my third year because I couldn't afford it. Didn't have anywhere to go, so I ended up being homeless in Cincinnati for like six months. Just lived in foreclosed houses, uh, got familiar with... The people on the street that you look at and you try to turn away from that you're afraid to talk to. So got very familiar with that community, really wanted to be an advocate, but not in the way that's super sappy and not helpful. So I moved to Connecticut where my parents lived, which was, you know, horrible because my parents and I don't have a great relationship. And I lived with them for a few months um, and 
while I was in Connecticut, I was researching, you know, morbid things that have happened in the area because I found myself on the internet a lot looking at like horrible things. And this is what I tell every class that I tell to like, it, you know, like it's, it's not a set path that's defined. You don't have to major in criminal justice. You don't have to take a set path. You don't have to become an officer. You might just have like a morbid curiosity and you don't know why. So I told my dad one day, I was like, dad, like I spend a lot of hours on the internet looking at like live leak and horrible content. And it's not that I want to do anything. Like I don't want to like do these horrendous acts, but I find it interesting. And he was like, you could be an intelligence analyst. Like you could, you know, get into that field without being a lawyer or a, an officer. Cause I definitely didn't want to be a cop. So I was looking at stuff in Connecticut and I found um, there's this turnpike in the state that is lined with motels and it formerly was um, lined with brothels as well. It was a major truck stop area that truck drivers would stop off of the interstate and, you know, get their, get their fix, I guess, and stay in hotels, motels. Um, a lot of sex trafficking going on there. A guy wrote a book, well-researched case studies. He wrote a book about the trafficking that was going on there and the serial killer that was killing like prostitutes, sex workers, um, underage victims that were in these circles. And so I just took a shot and I was like, hey, I'm 21 years old and I have like this morbid curiosity. I don't have a college degree but is there any way that I could help you? And he was like, you know what? We do investigations with the police, the state police, different city police, like throughout New England. You're young. You seem like you know what you're talking about and you have like good intentions. Let me introduce you to them, uh, to the officers, to like the, the law enforcement agencies. Um, because maybe we could put you into covert work like covert investigations. So long story short, they, they accepted me and they're like, you could pass off as an underage stripper. And they put me in um, a strip club that was on this turnpike. And they're just like, you just talk to the girls, find out where they're from, why they're here, how old they actually are, you know, who their families are like next to kin. Um, just like use your social skills to get more information on them. We're not here to arrest them. We're here to rescue them. So that's, that's where I got my start. Wasn't paid. Like I was just doing this voluntarily, uh, to get experience. So that's where it started. That's where the human trafficking started. And we, we were able to shut down those strip clubs that were running trafficking rings. That's probably chapter one. <laughs> yeah, a very intriguing chapter one. And then how do you go from, from that kind of this roundabout path into leveraging that into a, a career as a criminal analyst? I just got lucky because I reached out to the right people. My family and I aren't very close. I've sought safety in relationships like dating men, safe men that were like kind and like maternal providing. So I was dating somebody at the time that allowed me to like, you know, like not have to work and like do this stuff and get the experience. We broke up. He broke up with me. I was very depressed. At the same time, my best friend died of a heroin overdose. And then my dad got diagnosed with cancer in the same week. Um, and my dad and I are close enough. Um, so I was like, 24 years old and I was like well, I'm gonna lose my mind so I applied to a job in Canada because I wanted to get the hell away from the state I just wanted to get away from everything and I was just looking for anything and I was like what is crime related and then I found a criminal intelligence analyst position in Halifax Nova Scotia and I was like I could apply to it you know I'm Canadian um, I've been doing this covert work and sure shit, I got it. Like I got the job. 
And I took my $200 and my cat and my crappy Prius and I drove from Connecticut to Nova Scotia. And I lived there for a year and a half. And immediately they put me on that major human trafficking case. And I just worked on that case for a year and a half amongst other cases too. Like we, there were different child exploitation cases, but they were like, you have a niche for child sex crime. We're going to put you on any case that deals with that. Cause we have a lot of it here. Do that. Um, the person that I was filling in for maternity leave came back and they offered me a full-time job. And I was like, I don't want to stay in Canada. And I moved back to Cincinnati where I was homeless for six months. Found a crime analyst position here and I ran the unit here and did all the um, child exploitation, uh, internet crime investigation cases in Cincinnati. So I've been here since then. Absolutely. And and it's, and to clarify just for the listeners, it's, mm-hmm. is it, is it like, can you tell us that, you know, private sector versus public sector working with the police or, you know, the, the, the differences there? Because I think a lot of people just assume, you know, they get one image or, you know, like the FBI does all this, right? So talk us through the Absolutely. players. Yeah, for sure. In, in um, the- so I can say like, so most of the jobs that I've had have been public sector. It's painful to try to work with other departments, but when there's a real threat that's like immediate, it's easy to get their attention even on a a holiday for that country, even if it's cross jurisdictions. Um, For lower level crimes, if you're working for the government and even if you're working for a metro government like Cincinnati, Indianapolis, even LA, New York City, it's really hard to work alongside a federal agency for a crime unless there is an immediate threat. Um, With some positions in the public sector, even if it's metro, federal, local, you have a security clearance a lot of the time to get access to information. And throughout the department, you get certain levels of access. So as a clerk, you might just see the case numbers or the people involved. As an Intel analyst, you could get more details like the narratives and photos. But if you're not assigned to a certain homicide case, then you wouldn't get that information. So your security clearance moves up the more information you have available to you. And with that, if you give any information away, you could get fired or get imprisoned. So that is the public sector. That's the public sector side of it. Private sector, which I've only been in since March, um, you get contracted to different agencies where they grant you that security clearance and determine what you you are allowed to see and you're not allowed to see. So a lot of the times when you think that um, officers don't know information, you know, like we're, we're talking about the ballistics that came out with the affidavit, they know. They're just not allowed to say, depending on security clearance. You, you can't come out with everything because it's going to compromise the investigation. Um. Even federal agencies are like this, like not all agents have access to all of the information. So with that, that's great. Um, You know, it protects the victims, it protects the case. But at the same time, that's where things can get lost and mistakes can happen. I'm curious, you know, you've built up all this expertise with the child sexual abuse materials networks and these crimes against children, Mm -hmm. um, online crimes against children. Can you, can you talk us through in your experience, what do those, I guess, for lack of a better word, ratings tend to look like? I, I imagine it can vary quite a lot depending on what, you know, the circumstances are, but in your experience, kind of, kind of looking into those things, you know, how would you sort of think about a CSAM ring and, and sort of what, how big they can get, how small they can be, you know, are they, 
operating in real life or just online? I guess what's been your experience generally? So it's complicated. Um, there are people that operate on a local level um, where they know people that might work at like a large co corporation that have some sort of, I don't even want to call it a sexual kink because it's rape, but they, they know, which is really strange because I feel like I have so many interests and then I never run into anybody with the same interests, but these people are finding each other and they're into child porn. But they find these people at these large corporations sometimes. And they'll be like, hey, this is, you know, my account, whatever. Or in the days of like Backpage, um, which is still a thing. It's just not Backpage anymore. You post classifieds to people and then that's where the local community comes in. Like, so that, that's not really going to spread internationally or nationally. In my experience, the the biggest case that I, I worked on, they were just driving through parking lots and finding teenagers. Like they were teenagers that were outside of school in parking lots and like gas station parking lots or like Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. And it's like, the predator knows that they should be in school and they know that they're underage and they sense some sort of vulnerability and they're probably, you know, outside on the back wall smoking a cigarette. And then the guy comes up and is like, Hey, you want to make some quick money, some quick cash, or, you know, are you looking for drugs? Like I have a really easy way and you don't have to go back to your parents' home. If like, if you if you don't want to be with them, like I have an extra room you can stay in and then they groom them in that way. So it's, it's sort of an immediate grooming process where it's like, you want to just not be around your parents and go, go like smoke crack in my living room and like have a place to stay. And then they, they sell them out. They sell them out and say like, okay, we're going to post classifieds or I'm going to reach out to the network that I know. And we're going to, if you want to keep staying here, if you want to keep, you know, using cocaine, you're going to have to, you know, have sex with my buddy. And then, and then they post the classifieds and stuff. And then they'll have big parties where they get sold out. So that's the local ring, which is the easiest form. Typically when you get into the dark net stuff, that's where it gets really, really complicated because as I said earlier, you're crossing jurisdictions, usually. You know, you, you end up in places that are higher risk countries that have uh, more ambiguous rules against sex trafficking, where they're able to put lipstick on a child and sell them online without getting in trouble. So yeah, in like Taiwan, there's some like Eastern Asian countries that don't really have regulations against that. And if you're able to access those networks online, you can seek those options out. In the U.S., it's harder to, I guess, sell children or people because we have such high regulations and standards. It's easier to purchase from one of those countries, which, I mean, just speculation. If the case is going where we think it's going with, with Kagan he started with the local ring and tried to go international and that's where he got screwed up. Right. And, and that's one thing that we've kind of always talked about with Delphi, I guess the, the idea before we, before we get into sort of the murders themselves, the idea that um, why is somebody who's trying to produce child uh, sexual abuse materials? Why is he talking to local girls? Because it's easier. It's easier. You can find, you can, seek out vulnerable and especially with that age you know you remember what it's like to be like 11 12 13 where you're even if you have a good home life you're just so desperately lonely and everybody around you is starting to get into boys or dating and like you want to be cool sometimes and you know smoke cigarettes and hang out in a parking lot and this is speaking from my experience as somebody that skipped a lot of classes and smoked cigarettes on the side of buildings. Like, you want to feel loved. And in this case, it was 
it might have been nothing more than that. In a lot of cases, it's, you know, drug related. There's a lot of abuse at home. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes it's mental illness. There's a lot of things that play into it. But with this case, it, it could have just been a, a girl that was lonely and found a boy online that was cute. And, you know, she liked that attention and was excited to show it off. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I feel like every kid that age is kind of trying to figure themselves out and figure like, how can I be attractive to other, you know, people essentially. And 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 that's a part of growing up and predators know how to, you know, certainly exploit those very everyday insecurities that a kid would have. And it's easier to find them. Like I said, when you, if you're local and you see them, if you spot them, like, in the school parking lot or like with a town so small as Delphi, like, you know who these families are, you know, who might have younger pre-teenage kids, younger, whatever, whatever you're looking for. And you create a fake account and you find them. You can find them by their last name or their family name. And that's an easy way to get super close access And so like in a world where you can access kids from all over the country, that's where it's more practical for you to seek out the local options. How often do cases like this lead to murder? I don't know statistically, but not a lot. It's, it leads to rape and hostage situations. I mean, it's rape in general, but you know, it, it, it usually doesn't always lead to the death of a child or even an adult victim because they don't want to get caught. They want to continue this. You know, you think of like higher profile trafficking cases like Jeffrey Epstein, nobody died. Yeah. That seems like a surefire way of bringing the police down on whatever operation you're running. Yeah. But it sounds like it is more common for the CSAM rings to have an in real life component to them as opposed to playing out entirely online. Yeah, uh, I think it's more common than you would think. A lot of people that seek out child molestation and um, child sexual abuse material, the abuse material that they're getting might not be local, but if they move to the point where they want to participate, either even if it's in like voyeurism, like where they don't actually have physical contact it's more common for them to be local. They're not going to travel outside of their town. In terms of the people who are in these rings, and I, I imagine there's a lot of variance here. So if you could speak to that, that variance, um, like, are they all like buddies? They know each other or is there a level of an anonymity? Does it depend on the type of ring? Um, it really depends on the type. Some of them just meet online in different forums on the net. Some of them meet in prison, but a lot of the times, like, they're not meeting each other in person. There's not a meetup group for child predators. Like, they find each other online and they build a relationship with one another. So, like, let's, like, think back on Kegan Klein's account where he was the, the female, right? The female fic account. I don't know for sure who he was messaging in those times, but that is the exact example of how those types of people end up connecting. I have this. What do you have? Let's trade back and forth. Yes. And there seems to be this kind of coded language. I'll say the other account names also had sort of generic female sounding names, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it, it would be like indirect talk about, oh, you know, what do you have? What do I have? Without admitting, they're not saying, hey, what type of child sexual abuse materials do you have? They're, they're mm-hmm. sort of, there's this language almost that they're kind of uh, sharing. Yeah. And a lot of the times for like recruitment too, it's similar language, just going through like different cell phone records for predators. A lot of the times, other than the access that they do to classifieds, that's where like they will meet people. They'll they'll bring Johns in from the classifieds ads. The way that they're recruiting girls is through the girls that they've already met. And they'll be like, do you have any friends that are age whatever that are looking for a place to go? 
and I just remember the most like upsetting text that I read was my 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 youngest friend is 10 years old and the guy said do you have anybody younger and then he like goes on to like bribe her when and like offer her more things to get the younger girls in and that's where you get the concept of what they call a top bitch which is the the girl or woman that's recruiting other girls and women into the ring so it, as far as like meeting the girls or women in the trafficking ring they typically meet them through the girls they once they find their select few victims they don't go out and prowl anymore they use their resources to bring in more people and then they post pictures of the girls or what have you on the forums and then that's where they meet their clientele so once they have those initial victims they don't really need to be out in person anymore when we're talking about the police investigation of these types of CSAM rings, again, acknowledging that there's a lot of variance in what types, you know, we could be talking about here. But, you know, what are some of the challenges that come about? Because it's, it's, it becomes, as far as I see it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it becomes less about like catching one guy and more of like this, there's a ring that's sort of this almost criminal enterprise working together that, uh, needs to be taken down or, you know, and, and, and I guess if you could speak to some of the challenges that arise from trying to deal with that rather than just a single person who's maybe committing sexual crimes by themselves. Yeah. And no, it's, it's definitely difficult. And there's a lot of morality issues that surround policing internationally for this type of crime. Right. So, you know, U S where it's not, illegal to be a sex worker necessarily like again that's the gray area there are some countries that follow this like this nordic model where it's like we we arrest the, the men but not the girls we don't punish the girls but then there's complications that come with that because uh, victims of this community are desperate and or they have an addiction or they need some sort of income or they just want to sell sex i mean and once you start punishing the people that per purchase sex workers you make it more dangerous for the sex worker because regardless of if you're arresting the johns they're going to seek out this type of work anyways and when you arrest the johns they're going to go to more dangerous forms of seeking out their clients and they're going to get guys that are more willing to like participate in this risky behavior. And that's where like more violent behavior can come in from their clients. But at the same time, when you have like lax regulations that allows for more traffickers to come in and just sell girls out. But that also comes with strict regulations. Like there's, there's not really a lot that you can do to, stop this type of crime unfortunately it's it's like it's similar to gun crime you know you you want to take away guns but shootings are still going to happen but the solution isn't to put more guns out there like it's very 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 complicated with a specific like csam ring where you know say they're talking to kids you know and they're they're pretending to be a kid and facilitating the exchange of photos and communications and things like that. Um, how does, how do, how do you start to unravel that once it becomes apparent that such a ring is, is in, in operation preying on, on kids who are, let's say in this case, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're communicating, but they're not necessarily aware that they're communicating to a, to a predator, I guess. It's tough. And it, it, there's not really any way that you can regulate it until they meet in person or report it. A lot of the times with social media, there, there are certain types of regulations that they have, which are like, are actually pretty good. Like the machine learning tactics that they have to pinpoint people that might be predatorial, uh, whether it be common IP addresses that they've seen with sex offenders or with suspicious accounts phone numbers that they use to sign up their accounts for 
uh, they usually can can identify predators before they even send that initial message. And then a lot of the times those accounts can get shut down even while they're they're messaging somebody because the I, uh, suspicious activity has been reported already through those accounts because they're reaching out to several people. In the Delphi case, it appears to us, and I think most people who are observers of it, that, you know, Libby was of the belief that she was messaging with another teenager and and was there was a catfishing element to this and how how pervasive is that within these sort of networks that you've encountered and you've sort of helped to investigate so with this case happening in 2017 2016 this happened before a rash of regulations were set out by social media where it was kind of I think you had an interview with somebody before on your podcast where it was like, it was just free game when you were on the internet, you know, like you could sign up for an account, you could use stock photos, you could use pictures of a model, you could use like a fake phone number, fake name, blah, 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 blah. Nobody would question it. There was an FBI shutdown of a lot of, you know, like back page accounts. And with that came more security regulations for social media sites so they have this process internally that will filter those photos out. And if they come across any sign that you're using a fake photo or a model's photo or a stock image, they're going to shut you down. If they think that you're using a VOIP phone number, uh, which is just like, you know, like a WhatsApp phone number or, uh, you know, like a, an application where you can get the phone number rather than a physical phone, they're going to shut you down. If you don't have an email address or you can't, you know, like confirm any information, they're going to shut you down. Even if you get through that process, if there's anything that's suspicious about your account, you don't make any posts, you don't have any information, they're going to put that into a bin of data and say, this is suspicious activity and they're going to shut you down. 2017, 2016, they didn't have such rigorous data processes in place for those accounts. That makes that makes a lot of sense. So we're, we're kind of in a new era, it sounds like, in terms of some of this regulation. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's only going to get more strict. You know, like it, it was when the Internet came out when, you know, we were kids, there was just full range of freaks and nobody is checking in on anybody and you you can give people your asl and nobody's looking at it the way that it works now is if there's any sort of suspicious activity they're going to flag it and they're going to be like what is this and a lot of it is ai machine learning operated whatever the machine learning doesn't catch is going to be sent to a real person and they're going to be like why was this flagged as strange Let's look into this case more. Granted, it's not going to catch everything, but as big data and technology has advanced, you know, we've been able to filter that down way more than even we were able to in 2017. One thing I'm I'm sort of curious about about your work is you're you know you're an analyst. What's like a typical day at work like for you? <laughs> when you get up, what, what are you doing? Obviously, don't give us details about ongoing cases or anything, but just a general idea. I think that'd be very interesting. Oh, that's tough. I don't do the same thing every day. I wake up and I go for a run. <laughs> and then I make coffee and then shit hits the fan. Um, I can say like, you know, when I was running a unit, you'd have come, people come in and we'd have a short meeting on how their cases were going and where they were in a particular investigation for the analysts. You know, like, are you making a link chart, timeline, profiles? Where are you in the investigation? Are you giving a court testimony? You know, it, it was that. But as far as the analytical work, they could be doing a number of different things and working on several cases at the same time. It also depends on like when warrants are executed for um, like call detail records, text messages, 
when those come in, once you get a cell phone dump, then you can pay attention to that. But then you might also have a robbery case where you might need to like make a timeline of different locations that have been broken into and what items were stolen. Uh, so it really, it's, it's made for the person that has ADHD. <laughs> You know, like you're doing a lot of tasks at once. There's not a typical day of work. You know, I, I spend a lot of my days working on cases, but then teaching classes or driving out to different courts and getting information um, to put into a link chart. Like there's there's not really a typical day, I don't think. I guess another thing that kind of interests me is you spend so much time thinking about the absolute worst of humanity and all these terrible things that people do to each other and to children. How do you deal with that emotionally? Honestly, I've gotten so lucky to have great friends that will let me vent about morbid subjects and like not they're not necessarily like oh tell me tell me more what's going on there they're just like it's pretty fucked up cat hmm. it's weird okay my boyfriend is fantastic i spent a lot of time in therapy i write a lot i just i'm just so passionate about the subject that i don't let the negative take over my life because I would rather spend a lot of my life helping kids. And you mentioned that early on, somebody said that you had like a special affinity for working in this area. What is it about you that makes you have that affinity or that talent in this particular area? Um, I think uh, it just comes from being a neglected child, but your dad is a data analyst and your mom is an attorney so <laughs> no no it's a special special cocktail of of things also yeah you know this is, i i sometimes tell people this as well but like i'm asexual so that helps a lot too you know when i see any sort of sexual exploitation sex crime i don't connect it with sexual activity i would i would look at it and see it as if the same, like if I were seeing like an assault, like there's no difference in my mind. So that helps a lot too. So a special cocktail of things. Would you have any recommendations for, for listeners who are, you know, maybe I think it's really interesting and cool the way you sort of went into this work. It's like you kind of acquired a lot of experience and, and were able to leverage it into a, this career. Um, and if people are hearing that and some of your story is resonating with them, you know, what recommendations would you have for them to try to to work in this space of, of criminal analysis? Yeah, for sure. Um, I am not the ideal candidate for a high professional job. You know, I my GPA in high school was like below a 2.0. I barely graduated. It was amazing I got into college. I did okay in college but dropped out because it was too expensive i was like a, a shitty rebellious kid i smoked cigarettes when i was 15 but i was passionate enough about people that i was determined to make something with that and i think it's really important to to recognize if you have a, a gift with something you really don't need to focus on the numbers that come with it, like your GPA or classes. That stuff can be important to an extent, but if you're passionate enough about something, just email somebody, just find their contact information and keep knocking on doors and being like, I'm really passionate about this. I will do whatever it takes to work on this mm -hmm. and you'll land something. It, you know, I, I've taught a lot of college classes, um, which I, I always tell the kids that it's ironic because I never finished college. And they ask me the same question. They're like, how did you get into this? Like, what were your interests? And it's like, I don't have a definitive path to tell you. You know, just follow what you actually want to do rather than following 
what you think is the right thing to do. What people have told you your whole life, you know, don't go into business school just because, you know, your parents are telling you to, if you want to go, if you want to do whatever the hell you want to do, just go do that. Just don't kill yourself in the process. Like that was always kind of my, my motto or it's like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to turn out fine. I'm going to do what I'm doing and I'm going to turn out just okay. And I did. I was wondering in terms of uh, the Delphi case, I mean, we, we, we're kind of in a, a strange place here with that case because, uh, you know, for, for a while, it seemed like there was, you know, a definitive social media angle that the police were pursuing. Now we're in a mode where there's actually been a, a person arrested for it. It's not clear if they're related to that. Um, and I think it's we're in a situation where, you know, as journalists, we can we can theorize all we want, but ultimately we're going to go, what are the facts that we know versus what we don't know? So we're we're kind of hewing to that at this point. But that being said, as as you sort of um, have analyzed this case yourself and sort of with your own experience in mind, um, what are some other uh, aspects of the case that stand out to you or that you even, you know, just have further questions on that you'd want answered to kind of better understand it? I'm really interested in the fact that they immediately put out Kagan Klein's username and the information about him and made such a direct connection from him to the Delphi murders. Whether he's related to them or not, or if he did it or not, they were so confident about putting that information out. And then finding out that there was some sort of Dropbox activity within his uh, digital forensics, whatever they came up with, but he was secretive about that. And there was one device that he wouldn't bring out and then suddenly, however many months later, a different man is re- arrested. And whether or not that that man showed up earlier in the case, police would have known that, but they still put Kagan Klein's username out there, even if they had the information of Richard Allen before. What's interesting to me, too, with the probable cause affidavit coming out is that they do have ballistic information, which I know you guys knew that coming into this. The science behind ballistics is not entirely accurate, but it's similar to if you had found a cell phone on the scene or a SIM card on the scene and it fit or the serial number matched a phone inside the person's apartment. It seems like the bullet did come from the gun or from like a casing pack that was purchased for that gun. Uh, It sounds like that they might've had shell casings within that they discovered that were spent. If they did the ballistics testing and they said that the marks matched up, that means that they, they likely found spent casings. I don't want to say that definitively, but usually that's what that terminology suggests to me reading a lot of Niven reports the word sub- subjective comes in because they might, they don't want to say that for sure. He could have lent his gun out to somebody. He could have just been hunting in the area and like that. But with those markings that come on a casing from the gun, it's like fingerprints almost. It's like, it's the fingerprint for a bullet. So them putting out, Kagan Klein's username, but then arresting somebody else and then coming out with this ballistics information suggests to me that it could be that Kagan and Richard had a connection previously that involves some sort of trafficking network. Just from my experience, that doesn't mean that's what happened. Interpreting the Niven results and following the case and how they've presented it to the public, that is similar to a case that would follow that pattern. It's so funny with the bullet, whenever we talk to someone more on the law enforcement side of things, they're like, yeah, it's pretty good, it's fingerprints. And then all the, when we talk to people on the defense attorney side, they're like, this is terrible, throw it out. <laughs> well, cause like when you have people that don't, haven't looked at like casings before, um, Nibin is a very niche forensic subject. Like you would think ballistics would be very general, but Niven itself um, 
is very niche. The the documents that I gave you guys for the uh, crime gun intelligence centers that follow a specific standard. There is a reason that these sellers of casings and guns follow a standard that provide information for law enforcement agencies to make those connections. Whether or not he was the one that pulled the trigger, who knows? They're pretty sure that the bullet came from that gun. Yeah, they, they certainly, they're certainly, I mean, that's, that seems like the, uh, the crux of a lot of, of, of that PCA at least. And of course, right. you know, so and- it, it's not the same as like being saying this tire could fit on this car. Any, my Mazda tires could fit on any Maz, Mazda SUV. This shell casing, whether it was spent or not has, if it's fired through that gun, it's going to leave a print that is very specific that they've seen before. And then as, as far as, as your opinion goes, as somebody who studies some of these CSAM networks, um, if they're not able to link the CSAM angle here to the, to the Richard Allen angle, would, would that be, would you chalk that up to just sometimes there's just weird coincidences in life and that, I mean, yeah, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? There are, there are weird coincidences for sure. And if they don't have tangible evidence that said, hey, these girls are going to be on the path. You want to, you want to go there? If you're looking to fill an itch, if they don't have that, you know, as, as an analyst or as an officer or as a detective, you're just like, God damn it. (laughs) But From a legal perspective, from like the defense perspective, you can't make the connection. You're just, it's just speculation. Whether or not it's true, you can't prove that it is true. Yeah, that's, that's what we say. It's one thing to strongly suspect something and it's a completely other thing to be able to prove that in court and feel like you can bring a case against somebody. So Because if you're basing it on speculation, you're going to put, you have the potential of putting an innocent person in prison for something that's not related to them. Exactly. He, you know, he did shitty things. Kagan did, obviously, very disgusting. But you can't put murder on him if you don't have solid proof. Absolutely. And 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 you can't, you know, we can't draw lines that we can't draw. You know, I mean, if and that will ultimately come down to the investigation and what it says is, is there a link? what is their relationship and if there isn't then that's not going to be that's not going to be adjudicated we do find it interesting that they're saying we feel there may be more actors involved more tentacles so to speak but i think uh it's one thing to say that and allude to it publicly and it's a totally other thing to like you know start convicting other people basically i think that they're definitely treading a line of ambiguity with richard allen being arrested they would have put it out to the public already if they had a definitive link between any other men with him. They're just likely searching for more evidence to actually bring it to a case for whether it be Kagan, other people, whether it be somebody entirely different from Richard Allen. You know, like it's been, it's a high profile case. It's been a long time. They already screwed it up in one way um with the um clerical issue which is not i mean that happens but they don't want to bring this case internationally in front of the world without all of the information that they can possibly get we want to thank Catalan for sharing her terrific insights with us and for a great conversation We'd also like to thank all of the people who reached out sending us the Daily Mail article and asking questions. We think it's really important that you do this, and we always appreciate tips on what you're sort of seeing and what you'd like to know more about in the case as more information comes out. It makes us feel good to know that we have an engaged and informed audience that is watching our back to make sure we don't happen to miss anything. So our sincere thank you to all of you. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. 
If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murdersheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Hey everybody, just popping back in to talk about June's journey again. This is the amazing free-to-download mystery hidden object game. It's delightful. Anya is always playing this game. She's obsessed with it. I love to pretend to be a 1920s detective going around the world trying to solve different cases. It like puts me in that headspace that just makes me so happy. And also you get this big mansion that you get to decorate, and I think that satisfies my strange interior decorator needs where I can suddenly have a big swan pond, a gaggle of reporters outside, all these beautiful rose bushes. It's just amazing. Playing June's Journey has actually been a really nice mental health break for me. Sometimes it can kind of get stressful doing the podcast or, you know, just going day to day, waiting in line, waiting on a a call where you've been put on hold. And it's fun to have something to do to kind of eat up that time and keep me mentally sharp while I'm sort of waiting around. I feel like I've gotten a lot more observational as the game is going along. I I feel like sometimes I'm just like powering through these levels. It makes me really proud of myself. (laughs) And... I think you guys would love it. I really think a lot of our listeners are people who would actually really enjoy this game and would find it really sort of soothing, but also fun. Give it a try. Tell us what you think. The Murder Sheet is an independent, smaller podcast. We don't have a huge staff. Sponsorships are really important to us. And anytime our listeners goes ahead and downloads something or or purchases something from our sponsors, that's directly helping us. So if you can just go, again, this game is free to download, download it, put it on your phone, play it a bit, let us know what you think, and certainly let June's Journey know that the murder sheet sent you. That's a huge boon to our show, and it helps us keep in business and keep doing what we love, which is reporting on different crimes and bringing you the best information. So with that in mind, find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games.